And in the fifth chapter of the book of 2 Samuel, we want to begin reading with verse 17, and we'll read from verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Trust that you have your Bibles. I'm curious, how many folk have Bibles? Hold them up. All right. Beautiful. Second Samuel chapter five, beginning with verse 17. Let us read it aloud together. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David and David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephium. And David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gaza. Now I want you to pay particular attention to verse 23. David had already experienced one victory over the Philistines, our Philistines, if you prefer. And uh, he inquired of the Lord when they came back up uh, and asked the Lord, uh, shall I go out against them again? And uh, the Lord said, thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. He said, in other words, get into position, but don't attack. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. The Lord said, in other words, don't move against them until I give you the signal. And today I want to remind you to learn to move with God. Can you tell somebody that learn to move with God? I say that, God bless you, ushers that we must ask God to sharpen our spiritual sensitivity, that we will not act in haste, moving ahead of God, and that we will not be so faithless as to wait until the move of God is over and then move behind God. If we would have the victory that we desire and the victory that God desires us to have in every phase of our life, 
We must develop a spiritual sensitivity to know when the move of God is on and join the move of God. If there's anything at all that nature teaches us, it is the fact that our God is a God of precision timing. Nothing happens in nature except at the time designated. You can pick up uh, an almanac, uh, you can pick up calendars uh, that's printed years in advance, and they can tell you what time the sun will rise every day, what time is sunset every day, what is the date of the next lunar eclipse or solar eclipse. Every movement in nature is based on precision timing because God has set order in the universe. I've used this illustration many times, but say for instance today, we're here for the Holy Convocation. People have come from far and near. And I remember as a youngster uh, growing up in the Church of God in Christ, God blessed me to be a child here in Memphis uh, growing up when Bishop Mason was yet active. And uh, at age 12, my family moved to Detroit. That was in 52. That was at the same time that Bishop Mason moved to Detroit and lived in the house with Bishop J.S. Bailey. Uh, but then after I hit my teenage years, I would go to, like all other young folk, the Youth Congress Convocation and the young fellows, we went uh, hoping to meet some young ladies. <laughs> now, my day for that is gone because now I'm an old married man. <laughs> but there are yet young people who go to the meetings not for the spiritual value, but to, you know, meet someone hopefully of the opposite sex. But if there were a young man and young lady of the marriage age that would meet this week and say, all right, we're going to get married next weekend and, and, and we are going to stand on the word that in five months God is going to bless us with a beautiful, healthy boy baby. I don't care how they confess it. I don't care how they touch and agree. The time from conception to birth is not five months. Anything prior to nine months is premature. And it does not matter how you try to make God do things ahead of schedule. He is a God of precision timing. And in your life, nothing is going to happen until God says your season has come. You got a lot of people, they, they labor in the church and they get discouraged and disgusted because it looks like everybody is recognized except for me. Everybody else, when they do the least little bit, they get that pat on the back and that compliment before the sanctuary. But if I do it, I can work in the church for years and they never acknowledge me. If they print something and put my name on it, that line of type is almost always smeared. <laughs> And the devil will make you think that you are not appreciated and your day will never come. But the word of God is, let us not be weary in well-doing. <laughs> Reaping time is coming, but when is it coming? In due season, you will reap if you faint not. You ought to tell somebody, don't faint. Don't faint. Your due season is on the way. Hallelujah. God is a God of precision 
timing. And if we learn how to move with him, we'll be successful every time. Oh, yes, I, I knew a preacher once upon a time that took over a church and the church looked like God was ready. He was moving at that time. But this particular preacher was nearing retirement age. And he said, well, I've got about nine and a half more years before I retire. But the Lord kept saying that my move is on in the church. You need to give full time. But he wouldn't come off that job because he said, I've got nine and a half more years. So when nine and a half years had expired, he came off the job. But the move of God was over in the church. And he couldn't understand why God wouldn't bless it. God said, I told you nine and a half years ago that this was your season but you let your season pass. Yes, it's true that a lot of people in their zeal, they run ahead of God. But then there are other folk that are afraid to step out by faith and a move of God is on, but they don't see it. You know, the church is full of doubting Thomases now. Yeah, I know, uh-uh, honey, I, no, no, I just can't get with that. And by the time you make up your mind that this is the move of God, the move has gone and left you behind. You ought to tell somebody, that's why we've got to develop spiritual sensitivity and learn how to move with God. This story today deals with David, the second anointed king of Israel. I say the second anointed king because before the time for the monarchy had come, there was one who attempted to be king. But when God finally sanctioned through Samuel that he would allow Israel to have a king, God said, all right, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Uh, in other words, that the beginning of the monarchy signals the end of the theocracy. And uh, you cannot have a theocracy and a monarchy at the same time. If man is king, then God cannot be king. So God said, all right, let them have a king, but I'll choose him. And we often talk about Samuel and his rejection. But the one thing we should remember is before Samuel was rejected, he was first of all chosen by God and anointed by God. But the time that God chose him and anointed him, it was true that from statue, he was head and shoulders above all of the rest of the men of Israel. But he had an humble heart. So humble was he that when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, his father, Kish, his donkeys, his asses had run away. And Kish sent Saul and one servant to go and try to find those asses. They searched everywhere and couldn't find them. So finally they stumble upon the village where the prophet Samuel lived. And one said, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man, and all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Let us inquire of him. Maybe he can tell us the way we should go. And finally, when the next day they got a chance to talk to Samuel, Samuel looked at Saul and let him know that you are the one whom the heart of Israel is resting on. Israel is looking for a king and you are the man. So now as far as the, uh, uh, those asses are concerned, uh, you're going to find them. That's no problem. He went looking for donkeys and found himself anointed as king. 
And when Samuel wanted to introduce him to Israel, he was so humble that the Bible said he went and hid himself among the stuff. He didn't even want to come out and be introduced as the king. And as long as he remained humble, God used him. Uh, you can say what you want to. God has not changed. Even now, God will use those who walk before him in humility. But when we get so big until we are bigger than everything and everybody and even have the audacity to second guess God, we are only a few steps from rejection. Samuel told Saul, you go down there and kill all of the Amalekites. The king, from the king down to the smallest baby, kill the cattle, extinguish the whole nation. But now after Saul had a few victories under his belt, he decided to second guess God. And God rejected him and sent Samuel to him to say, now I want you to remember something, Saul. When thou wast little in thine own eyes, was it not then that God made you captain of his people, even Israel? In other words, he said, when you were still little, humble in your own eyes, that was when God elevated you. But when you started realizing your greatness, that's when God cut you down. I've talked to many preachers and I've said that one scripture is a passage that I have planted deep in my mind and in my heart because any one of us, doesn't matter how God use you, the day that you look in the mirror and see what other folks see, that's the day that God begins to cut you off. I think you need to look at somebody and tell them that. The day you look in the mirror and see yourself great, that's the day that your rejection begins. God rejected Saul. Told Samuel, now you go down to Jesse's house. I have chosen among his sons, a king. And here goes the prophet, down to Jesse's house, down to Bethlehem. Jesse, I've come to do sacrifice today. And I also have a secret mission that Saul can't hear about. I've got to anoint one of your sons as king. And when the oldest boy walked in, even the prophet Samuel was deceived. He saw him standing there. He said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. God said, I haven't chosen him. <laughs> the second boy and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one and even the seventh son of Jesse came in and God said, I haven't chosen any of these. Do you have another son? Yeah, I got a little lad out there with the sheep. Little strange fella out there playing on a homemade harp, plucking on the strings, talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now you don't want the young boy. He said, go get him. When Samuel, when David walked in, the horn of oil tilted. And David in 1 Samuel 16 and 13 was anointed for the first time at home in the presence of his brothers. So you got a lot of folks, they want to go cross the water and cross the land, but nobody can remember when they got their first anointing at home. But there ought to be a home base where people who knew you before you met God will know that this is not the person that we used to know. I've often wondered why out of all of those eight brothers, why God chose David. He was the youngest. And usually we like to go by seniority. But God does not choose the way we choose. He got his own style. 
And, and when I tried to wonder why would David be chosen above the rest, and then I thought about it. The harp, he was a psalmist. Look at somebody and say he was a praiser. And you can say what you want to. God loves people who will praise him. Uh, you can sit up looking deep. You can sit up with the motto, nothing shall move me. But God loves praises. He loves folk that don't mind giving him the glory. He loves people that don't always beg for something new. But I'm still thanking him for what he did yesterday. I don't know what he's going to do today. But because of what he's already done, I can enter his gates with thanksgiving. I can come into his court with praise. You ought to tell somebody, don't wait for him to do something new. Praise him for what he's already done. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, David's first anointing. 1 Samuel 16, 13, was at home amidst his brothers. And the Bible said from that day forward, the Spirit of God came on him. And one thing about it, whenever God anoints you, look out. Satan is after you. He's not after you because you're so pretty. He's not after you because you're so smart. He's after you because the anointing of God is on you. And after David was anointed, it wasn't long before he was summoned into the presence of a rejected and now demon-possessed King Saul. And in those days, they didn't have anything to calm down somebody who was possessed of demons. They hadn't discovered Prozac. <laughs> and the only thing that would quieten him down was for David to go and sit in the corner of the room plucking on the strings of his harp. But in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David is anointed the second time. And when you read chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, it says that the elders of the tribe of Judah anointed him. Now, that's something you need to see there. That although God, through the prophet Samuel, anointed him at home, Samuel's anointing did nothing but cause the Spirit of God to come up on David. But before David could begin to be king, he was not king over the tribe of Judah until the elders of the tribe anointed him. In other words, the people had to give him the right to be their king. Oh, you didn't get that one. In our church, we have not only a Bible, but a constitution. And our constitution mandates that every four years that the church of God in Christ holds an election to elect its board of trustees, to elect its general board, to elect its presiding bishop. And you cannot go around preaching the evil of election when we've been doing it ever since Bishop Mason died in 1961. The first election wasn't an organized general assembly, but we elected Bishop Jones, O.T. Jones Sr. And then from 1968, we began to elect our presiding bishop every four years. And from 68 all the way up through 96, elections have never been evil. But now for some reason, 
the election has become evil. People have to give you a right to serve them. You cannot rule people by divine right. That's a monarchy. Oh, y'all not listening at me. The elders of the tribe of Judah, they anointed David to be their king. And it wasn't long after they anointed him to be their king. Saul finally died, but he had a son named Ishbosheth. And Ishbosheth wanted to be king. And it took David two years to put down the rebellion of Ishbosheth. But when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 5, it starts off with all of the elders of all of the 12 tribes coming to Hebron and that all of the elders of all of the tribes anointed David as king over all Israel. I keep telling you the original anointing that came from David was God dealing with David's spirit but he had to have the second anointing to be king over Judah. And he had to have the third anointing to be king over the whole nation. And took somebody and tell them the people whom he was to serve had to anoint him to be their king. Somebody ought to give God some praise about that. We've had a glorious convocation, but the only thing that really grieved me, nothing said against me bothered me. I expected all that. But what bothered me was Thursday night at the pyramid when a false prophet alarmed the saints, saying God sent him to Memphis with a message to say to the church of God in Christ and to the 12 bishops that if you allow this damnable election, all 12 of you are gonna drop dead. Now that's how I knew he was false. <laughs> Understand. Understand that we as the 12 board members, we are servants of the church elected by the General Assembly. And if all 12 of us would have stood locked arm in arm and said, church, we will not have an election. We don't have the power because the Constitution and the General Assembly mandates the election and the 12 of us don't have the power to stop it. And God knew that. So when the man got up with that prophecy, it had to be a lie. It didn't come from God because God knew we couldn't stop it. And it grieves me when I can see a hoax being perpetrated against the saints of God. Oh my God, do anything you want to do to me and to any of the other leaders. We can take it, but don't do it to the saints. Yeah. Hallelujah. God will not hold you guiltless because the church doesn't belong to us. He said, take heed to yourself and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God. God said the church don't belong to you bishops. The church belongs to me. He said, I'm the only one that shed my blood. The elders of the 12 tribes, they anointed David to be king over all Israel. But as we began reading, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David, 
They said, wait a minute. Israel has been in a state of civil war. And don't worry about it. The devil doesn't have to attack us as long as we fight each other. So the Philistines stood back as long as it was David and Saul, David and Ishbosheth. But when they knew Saul was dead and Ishbosheth's rebellion had been put down, and now David was the king of all Israel, they knew it would take him a little time to consolidate the kingdom, and they said, let's go get him before he has a chance to consolidate the kingdom. And the Bible said they came up looking for David, but David went down into the H-O-L-D, into the hold, not a H-O-L-E. To say he went into a hole would say that he was a coward. But he went into the H-O-L-D, an abbreviated form of the word stronghold. He went into a fortified place. And when the enemy is after you, you got to know how to go into a fortified place. We're living in a day now when many of the charismatics, they speak in tongues more than we uh, Pentecostals. But most of them don't believe much in fasting. And they don't believe in waiting. In fact, now they tell you, you're born again, you got the Holy Ghost. Uh, you just got to go in and let us teach you how to develop your tongues. But I'm glad that I got saved and got that Holy Ghost that didn't nobody have to teach him how to talk. I'm sorry for you folks that got that new Holy Ghost that somebody had to teach him how to talk. But back in those years, Growing up as a youngster in the church, they taught us that when the enemy is on your trail and you need a hiding place, you got to learn how to shut in and how to shut out, how to get into a time of fasting and prayer. I had a number of people say to me this week, Bishop, uh, I tell you, I I'm just so glad to see how you're looking and everything is great. Well, I told you all on the 29th of September uh, that I was beginning a period of 40 days of fasting and prayer. And if you saw me at dinner the other night, I didn't say 40 days and nights, I said days. <laughs> and my 40th day was the day the convocation ended. I mean, began rather on the 7th. Uh, but the Lord said, no, you just keep right on. Uh, so I think now I'm in probably day number 45. Uh, when you learn how to have fasting and prayer as your stronghold, you can hide and the devil can't find you. He can push all your buttons and you still won't react. He can wave a red flag in front of you like he's waving it in front of a bull and you still stay at peace. David say, I'm not quite ready yet to go out and fight the Philistines, so let me go into my stronghold. And he went into his place of retreat. When you go into your place of retreat with God and when your spiritual muscles begin to flex and you are ready for the enemy, then you can come out like David did. You can come out of your stronghold and you can tell the devil, if, if you think you want some of me, come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Satan, come on. I've got God's promise out of the 54th chapter of Isaiah. No weapon that is formed against me will prosper. You ought to go and tell somebody, get in your stronghold until you have God's assurance that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And then you can come out fighting. Hallelujah. 
Shekandabolosia. My soul delight in you, Jesus. When David came out, where were the Philistines? They were camped out in the valley of Rephim. Tell somebody the word Rephim means giants. See, see, that's the devil's strategy. He always wants you to believe that whatever you're facing is so big that it's going to scare you to death. Yeah, we Philistines, we came from giants. So we're going to camp out in the valley of giants. The devil brings you not little problems, but giant problems. Here they were spread all across the valley. We would have thought that David would have used some kind of military diversionary tactic and would have hit him on the left or hit him on the right. But David came out of the stronghold and hit him, boom, right straight through the middle. In other words, he said, I don't care, I'm going to hit your line right in the middle. And he said, I've made a breach on him. God has made a breach, even like the breach of water. In other words, God let David and his men break through just like flood waters, cut their own path. And David said, look here, this place has been turned from Rephim, and I'm going to change the name. I'm going to call it Bel Parism because God has made a breach upon my enemy. And the word Bel Parism means Lord of breaking through. I want you to know it doesn't matter how the enemy has solidified his forces against you. When God is on your side, he'll give you a breakthrough. I wish you'd look at somebody and grab them by the hand and tell them God doesn't want you to crack up. God doesn't want you to break down. He's ready to give you a breakthrough. <laughs> Does anybody in here need a breakthrough? Your breakthrough time has come. It's time for your breakthrough. The enemy has blocked you long enough. The enemy has held you back long enough. Sit down again. I'm almost finished. Hey. David got a breakthrough. But the one thing you got to remember about the devil, it doesn't matter how you whip him. He's really a dumb devil. You can just get through whipping him and he'll turn right around and come back. I even read that when Jesus was in the wilderness, fasting 40 days and was tempted of the devil. And Jesus took three verses of scripture from the book of Deuteronomy and whipped him. But the Bible says, one of the gospel writers says, Satan leaveth him for a season. Don't, don't, don't think that because he left once that you've whipped him for all. He'll come right back. David whipped him, but the Philistines regrouped came back again, camped out in the valley of Rephim, and David's adrenaline was yet flowing. He said, Lord, I, I, do, do I need to go back and whip him again like I did last time? And God said, no, 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 just form a compass. Do kind of a semicircle around him. Get your men in place, but don't move now. Don't move, Lord, Lord I just got through whipping him. I believe I'm well able to whip him. God said, don't move now. Why you don't want me to move now? He said, I don't want you to move until I move. Wait until you hear the sound of a going. Wait till you hear rushing in the tops of the mulberry tree. 
Now you got to remember, it was a mulberry tree that Jesus talked about when he said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to this sycamine tree. And a sycamine tree is a mulberry tree that stands about 40 feet or more tall from this floor up uh, just a little above the ceiling. And the Lord said, now, when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, I want you to know though, that that's not Philistines up there. The way the tree is made, the Philistines can't climb up to the top. So when you hear the rattling and the roaring up in the top of the mulberry tree, then you will know that my army has arrived. And I don't want you to move until I move. But when I start moving, that's when I want you to start moving. Now, what is he saying? He's simply saying that to really whip the devil, it takes a bilateral attack. It takes God moving in the heavenlies and you moving in the earth realm. I remember one of my mentors, the late Bishop F.D. Washington. He used to say that when you've got problems, you got to get down on your knees and pray as though everything depended on God. But then you got to get up off your knees and work as though everything depended on you. It takes a bilateral attack. Well, preacher, is that scripture? I believe it is because the Lord said, when the enemy has stopped up everything, your money has gotten funny. You're bound, bound in your spirit. Your physical health is messed up. You're bound in your health. You're just all tied up in knots. The Lord said, if you really want to be set free, whatever you loose on earth, I will loose it in heaven. Hey, hey, hot time of the most Sunday. Hey, thank you. But listen, when all hell breaks loose, children on drugs, spouse running the street, everything seemed like it's gone berserk. God said, if you want to bring it together, whatever you bind on us, I will bind it in heaven. Tell somebody, neighbor, I'm going to move with God. But when David moved and God moved, the Philistines were smitten from Geba all the way to Gaza. I want you to know that when you move with God, demons will flee before your eyes. When you move with God, sickness, illness, disease and infirmity can be healed in an instant. When you move with God, Satan has to get out of your way. If, if you don't believe it, ask the children of Israel. It took 430 years before God moved on their behalf. But one night at midnight, he moved. And when he moved, the firstborn in every Egyptian house was slain. And when they got down to the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army behind, wilderness on one side, mountain on the other, the Red Sea in front, 
But God said, I'm moving with you now. Moses stretched out the rod and the sea had to open up. When you move with God, nothing can stop you. Nothing can block you. When you move, finish I'm going to quit right there but somebody in here the enemy wants you to sit on your hands he wants you in the corner in a fetal position he wants you discouraged disillusioned and disgusted but I hear God telling you like he told Israel at the walls of Jericho the wall have me even cracked but shouts and I'll make the wall fall. Shouts, I'll give you the victory. Shouts.